And if that question is asked, many of us do not know. Oh, we have supplied so much of items. But that's only a means. It's like a doctor. When you go to a doctor, he gives you a certain medicine. Are you buying that medicine? Are you buying solution to the problem for you went to work? I want to go back to work tomorrow morning. Can you solve my headache? You have got your problem headache solved so that you can go to work tomorrow. The medicine is only a means. Very often we confuse these two products and the problems of the customer that we are solving. And once we get into that by understanding what problem of the customer are we solving, you will find tremendous scope for growth. Tremendous scope of growth. And examples were given to me by Tom just now about direct RX. How so problem of a particular customer or particular industry you are able to solve. <coughs> so let's see how we can go about doing this customer value creation. What steps are involved in this? Because very often we talk about technology. Since morning, I've been asking some of my students who are here and others, what's the number one problem you're facing? Problems are a differentiation, problems are about getting more customers. And then if you ask them, so what are you going to do? You're going to invest in technology. We are thinking. We forget that money has to come from customers. Why should they pay you? Why should they pay you? When you start thinking from that side, you'll find exploding opportunities. In the morning, an example was given of Kodak and IBM. How both of them started about in the 1800s and only one survived. And look at IBM, there's a consistent focus on how do we find out who's our customers? What does that be required? They have not lived with their legacies. They live with what will create value. When Lou Jessner took over the management of IBM, the first thing he did was what's called Operation Bear Hug. Where he asked his top 50 managers to go and visit five customers to understand what problems they have. And what is it that IBM can do? So not about technology. And that's how they came a solution. It is about consulting work. It is about solving problems for them. And this is a company which for the last 10 years is the highest patent registering company in the US. It's not that they forgot technology. But it's not about technology which we are doing. It's about what's going to happen tomorrow. So you want a combination of this passion for technology and the passion for solving customers' problems. And the moment you get into that, business looks very different. Very different. So what are the steps involved when you talk about customer value creation? We talk about it in the form of a cycle. Many of the speakers talked about this first point. It's about first choosing your customers. It's about an industry which you want to concentrate on. You want to concentrate within the industry which customers you concentrate on. Any customers, any order, doesn't make sense. It's about absolutely being very choosy. The more choosy you are, the more you're able to say, no, not this customer. It makes sense. And I'll give an example from Gopchans. Vasant, when he came here, I know Vasant now last about, about four, ten, seven years, eight years now. While he was in college itself, he would ask this question, which customer should I keep? Which one should I say no to? When he was still a student, right at the ground level to understand whether we should keep a customer, not keep a customer. Because a customer, please understand, in simple words, is a money-making machine. All the other machines in a company are machines that incur costs. The only machine which makes money in a company is a customer. And that part we do not look at. We look at them as something different. You put in something on this side, raw material, out comes money. You can't have something better. And how much time do you give for these customers? And all customers are not going to equal amount of money. So choosing customers to understand who's, which customers are going to be really good for us, which ones are not good for us. You won't understand. And this is a strategic part. But once this goes wrong, everything goes wrong. You go to State Bank of India, you can open an account for 500 rupees, you can get a checkbook, you can get everything. You go to HDFC, they last you for 10,000 bucks. You walk onto a multinational bank, it will be much more than that. They very choose whom they want to serve. Whom they want to serve. And I want to give an example here of what happened to one of my 
rich friends who stays in Juhu. The bungalow which we were staying in, adjacent bungalow was coming up for sale. The owner of the bungalow came and told him, listen, I'm going to sell off this property. If you're interested, I'll give you the first option. You match the price and you can have it. So this man asked him, how much time do you have? Will you give me? The fellow said, I'll give you six months time. He said, okay. So next week, when he comes back to the office, he rings up his bank and he tells the bank, listen, I got an offer of a bungalow for sale and I'm interested in buying it. The manager said, so what's the price? What security can you offer? And this man has debt, runs a debt-free company. No loans, nothing. He has too much of investments. Investment, I can tell you, I can tell the number of about 70 crores lying in the bank, either in the form of cash or investments. And that property would have been worth close to about 30, 35 crores. So this man, and this man didn't want to disturb his current investments. The banker said, we can look at this, provided you provide your existing house also on <laughs> hypothecation. He said, what? He said, no. This industry is a very difficult industry, so we want to be very sure. If you can provide for this, then maybe you can get back. He said, to hell with you. And he kept the phone down. And then he forgot about it. A week or so later, a common friend of his told him, I need to talk to the wrong bank. There is a so-and-so bank, which is from your industry, who will love this idea. Talk to them. And he gave him a telephone number of so-and-so person. So this man, he telephoned him. And it was on speakerphone. I happened to be in the, his office at that time. This man telephoned. He said, Mr. So-and-so gave me a reference. Can I speak with you? He said, yes, yes, of course. How can I help your service? He said, this is the situation. He said, oh, this is something which Mr. So-and-so in so-and-so department deals with. I'll transfer this call to him. Transfer the call. The moment the call went to the other person, person yes, he introduced himself and said, yes, sir, how can I help you? So he introduced himself and then said, this is the situation. He said, before we proceed further, can I know your balance sheet size, please? And then this man gave his number. The person from the bank, you know what he responded? He says, you should be ready to be dealing with us in about five years' time. Thank you very much for calling. And he kept the phone down. Simply kept the phone down. Very choosy about whom they want to deal with. May not be a very, what do you call, polite way of dealing, but it is very clear whom to deal with, whom not to deal with. In five years' time, you should be able to deal with us. And I kept the phone down. But what happens when we go to the market? Are we as choosy? Or anything is good business? <laughs> you want to be careful. You can't afford to be. That's precisely the logic which they say. <coughs> And once you have that, you will find your skills are so spread out, you are no good at anything. That's what happens. That's what happens. That's what happens. If you look back, 1991, Ratan Tata took over Tata Group management. The first thing he did was Tata Oil Mills is sold off. Tata Textile is sold off. And people raised it.